what a program today. I've used all my notes for the last speaker. Can you imagine having to follow him? <laughs> Gee. So anyway, I'm honored to be here with you today, and I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Tom Mater with Prison Fellowship that invited me here and kind of ran interference. I don't know if he's here today, but if he is, Tom, thank you so very much for getting me here. I'm going to move over to tell you a story about the power of God, because I went to a place I didn't want to go, and I'm going to back up and give you a little testimony, but then I'm going to try to give you a little advice about your children, because I turn out to be really the dad in the prison. But uh, I never dreamed I would be the warden of a prison. I am an agriculture teacher. Do we have any teachers out here in this group? I want to tell you, any one of you teachers can run a penitentiary, I promise you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Because I graduated from LSU, and I go out to be the ag teacher, teach the FFA. I get to that school, I go to Colorado, I want to go see the mountains, I'm going to teach out there. And uh, three months after being there in that school, I went to the principal and I said, I said, look, I can't do this, I don't like this job, I don't want to do this. He said, well, let me tell you what, you have a contract, and if you break that contract, I'm going to see you never teach again. I said, good, I'm out of here. <laughs> So, so that was the end of my teaching career. It was too hard. I could not do it. Anyway, I was working for the Louisiana Department of Corrections, appointed by Governor Edwin Edwards as an assistant secretary over all their farms and industries. So I didn't have anything to do with the prison, but I saw the prison warden was having more fun than me, and I decided I'd like to do that. So there was an opening, and you can be awful political in Louisiana back at that time. And so I got the job to be the warden of the prison. But I had never worked in a prison in my life. I had to know anything really about inside the prison. But be cool, I can do this, I believe. I called my mom. My mom will be the warden of the prison. Now here's my mom. She made me go to church every time the doors open from a little kid, as long as I can remember. My dad too. We never, I never heard my mom or dad say any profanity, never saw them drink any alcohol, and they wouldn't let me learn how to dance. And, and, and when I got to LSU, I said, I'm going to learn all the things they wouldn't let me do. I'm going to see what I miss. And, I had, and it took me seven years to graduate. But anyway, uh, Mom says, I said, Mom, I'm going to be the warden of this prison. Mom says, let me tell you. I'm thinking she's going to be glad. She says, let me tell you one thing. She said, I raised you right and you've been a reprobate ever since you went to college. <laughs> she says, God's going to hold you accountable that those men have a chance to know him because you're responsible for them. I said, yes, ma'am. She was not happy. But anyway, I went to that prison, had 1,500 inmates, three chaplains, said, you guys are going to be the shepherds. Y'all going to feed the sheep and if the flock don't grow. And... Uh, and the sheep aren't fed, I'm going to get a new shepherd. Now, what about that? Can't you understand? And so I passed it off. Did you see that? I just passed it off. Kept on being old Burl, having a good time. Comes time to go to this Angola prison. Now, let me tell you about Angola. I have 6,325 prisoners. If you get 50 years or less on your sentence, I send you somewhere else. Now, the exception, I got 1,000 more inmates that I don't have to send away. They can have short sentences because we train on them. I have murder, rape, armed robber, habitual felon. And the longest sentence there is 2,574 years plus 19 sentences of life. So that's, that would have to, he would have to live to 500 BC to serve that sentence. So anyway, pretty difficult guys there. So I didn't want this job. I said, I'm not going there. When the job came open, because I was too young at the time. That was 20 years ago. I've been there 20 years. Hadn't retired yet. And uh, I said, I don't want to go there. Everybody goes there, gets fired. The warden of the paid fall guys, not going. They said, well, you've got to go. You're the longest serving warden here. you got the most experience. You're the one need to go do it. I said, nope. I said, you have to give me a $25,000 pay raise. I knew they couldn't do it. It was impossible. Civil service, all this kind of stuff. And that was a lot of money about 20 years ago. 
Well, they did. <laughs> so I had to go. I said, I'm only taking it temporarily. All right, I'm not going to do it long. I've been there two months. And uh, the first thing I did, I'm looking at the sky because I knew I was out of my league. I could not do this prison. What it did is it turned me back to where my mom, the way she had raised me. I remember I would look at the sky. I would think of Solomon. I'd pray for wisdom. I would look at the sky and I would pray, 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 pray. Give me wisdom. Help me to decide what to do, how to handle this situation. And I would look back at the sky and I would say, thank you, Jesus. Because I wasn't that smart to come up with what you just told me. That wasn't of me. Two months into it, we go to an execution. And so that's cool. I'm for the death penalty. We'll go do that. And so we get carry this guy down there. It's time to do it. We carry him into the execution chamber. And, uh, and so, uh, but first, we go to see the governor to see if we're really going to do it. And if he's going to give a, have a stay or something, and that's customary in Louisiana to know for sure what he's going to do so we can plan for it. And he said no. As I was leaving the governor's mansion, a state trooper said, what time are you going to do it exactly? I said, I'm doing it from 12 to 3 a.m. He said, no, no, I want to know the exact time because we bet exactly when you do it. And we put a pot together, and whoever is the closest wins the pot. I said, okay, then I'm going to do it exactly at 12 minutes after midnight. Now, I just picked the time when a human being was going to die. So, but I, I didn't realize really what I was doing. So, I go on back, and that night we start to do the process, and we just go get him and bring him in there, and he's so afraid that he, he has to be carried in an upright position. His feet don't even touch the floor. He just, he just going along. We just carried him. And we lay him on the table. He don't say a word. When he sees the table, he just really freaks out with fear. And I immediately thought of the victim and how the victim must have felt. We lay him down on the table. It's time to start the process. I'm looking at the clock and I have to give a signal through a one-way mirror. There's only he and I in the room. Nobody else can hear us, hear what we say, hear what I say to him, or, or just, they can just see us. But I have to give this signal but where the executioners actually are because it's a one-way mirror so no one can see them who's going to actually push the drugs. So to give the signal, I did that, okay? So then they start the process, and four minutes later, after a minute and a half, he breathes two breaths, like that. And then he stops breathing about two and a half more minutes, then everything goes flat, and they'll give me a signal through the door that it's over and it's done. So they gave me the signal, it was over, and it was done, and I looked there at him, and I said, what have you done? You just kill that man. And you were the last person in this room, and you didn't say one word to him about his soul. You know what he did. You know he didn't talk. You know you just probably sent him straight to hell. And he said, and look what, and I said to myself, and look what they did. They cast lots because they bet on exactly the time he was going to die. And look what else you did. Who are you? You're not God. You can't pick a time when somebody dies. That's wrong. No human being should do that. And then I thought of the victim, and I thought I would do what I could for the victim to have helped the victim any way I could have. But then I looked at him, and I said, he has a soul, and you didn't do anything. All you did is gave that silly sign with your thumb that you saw in the movies that Caesar did to the Christians in the Colosseum and the gladiators when he meant for them to live or die. And I have to tell you, the next day I had to go see the preacher. Gave me two scriptures. Genesis, he said, in Genesis, he who shed man's blood, so shall his blood be shed. I said, no, no, preacher. Something in the New Testament. They killed everybody in the Old Testament. <laughs> we got to get to the New Testament. So, so uh, he goes to Romans, the 13th chapter, the first six verses. He said that God's all powerful. He's in control of everything. And there's an agent of wrath and so forth. And I said, okay, I can live with that. So therefore, from then forth on, we all agreed that on the execution team, we would, we would read the scriptures, we would say it, we would pray that we'd be in God's will, and we would go forth and do it. Next time with the next guy we were going to do was Antonio James, a, a, and he was a Christian man. We talked about the thief on the cross. We talked about this day I'll see you in paradise, and uh, what Jesus said to one of the men on the cross, and uh, on the other cross, and so... Uh, it meant that when you die, you'd go to heaven to me and to him. And so we talked about Billy Graham's book, Angels, Angels, where it says, when you die, your soul goes on up to heaven. And he says to me, 
he said, will you hold my hand while, so I'll be connected to this earth while I go on to meet Jesus? And I said, sure, I'm going to hold your hand. I thought of the victim. I couldn't hold their hand. If I could have, I would have, but I couldn't. You have to do what you can where you are. So that night we started the process and we couldn't find a vein and he would make fists and, and uh, he looked at me and everybody left the room and we finally got ready to do the process. And I said, Antonio, it's time. I said, you're going to get ready to see Jesus' face. The chariot's here to get you. So we started the process and he said to me, the last thing on this earth as I held his hand, he said, bless you. And I know he's in heaven today. A minute and a half, he turned my hand loose. The point is, the point is, we have to do and always remember to always obey and do what God would expect of us. Don't get in an environment where you don't and don't turn your back on Jesus because that's what I did during that first execution. But it changed me and then I knew I had to stay at that prison. So then I took the job and was glad to be there. But again, praying for wisdom. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do, and I want to show you about the seminary because you're doing it in Texas, and you're doing exactly what we do. And I got this Q deal here, and I'm going to try to get us a, I don't see any buttons on it. <laughs> I found one. Okay, there we are. I'm going to take you out on a quick little tour. I don't have a lot of time for this, but I want to also, uh, let's just, that button didn't work really. I'm still hunting a button. It's a little bitty box, too. Where's the button, guys? You know, I have a secretary that does all this kind of stuff for me. I don't do any details. We need our media people. Let's see. There we go. That green one. Uh, that green one. It's not a button. It's a color. All right. That green one. Green. Remember green for go. Okay. We go into prison. Now listen, we have about 2,000 born again Christians in this prison, and uh, we do a lot of work. We raise everything we eat, and uh, we have about 2,500 head of cattle. We own 18,000 acres, and you have more land in Texas at your prison. But we're just going to walk through here because I'm going to get to something real important. There, coming in the front gate, I've learned to forgive and forget about the things that are behind, and I press forth for the things that are before me. And you see a white mark. That was Philippians 3.13. That is Philippians 3.13. The ACLU told me I couldn't put it up. So I said, well, it doesn't say God. And they said, well, but it's got scripture on the bottom. I said, well, it won't. And so, <laughs> and so there it is. So, so it's still there. You see, you got to look twice. I get along with them real well. Believe it or not, I'm going to be on a TV program on Tuesday and for one hour with the head of the ACLU in Louisiana. She and I get along real well because I convinced her that she had to, she had to support my Second Amendment rights if I was going to do what she wanted me to do for her. She got it to go both ways. She said, okay. So we, she won me over. Inmates going to work, first job they ever had in their life. We work with, farm, we work with mules and horses. Public, thank you, working harder. You'll see the white horses again a little later. And uh, we picking greens. We cook well, do good. But the main difference is, is what makes this prison work was it's a God thing. They're cracking pecan. We give them a block and a road. You can crack pecans. And uh, here's the seminary. What happened was, it's praying for, for, for how to do the prison. I realize that corrections means correct deviant behavior. And I realize that moral people don't rape, pilfer, and steal. So if you can get people to become moral people, then you, you really have done moral rehabilitation and you've changed them. And so that's really what it's all about. It's changing people's lives so they don't hurt you again because it's about victims of violent crime. It's not locking, torturing, and... and uh, and lock and feed, it's about changing people's lives. So if they get out, they don't hurt you again. And so the only way to do that and where we want to find morality the quickest is in religion, in our culture. So if we can get religion in the prison, then we're going to find morality really quick. But we just can't care what religion it is or we cross the line. And we have to keep the separation of church and state. So the deal was the, the seminary folks 
came to see me. I didn't come to see them, but it actually was the president or the head of the Judson Baptist Association that said, why don't we get the seminary here in the prison? Because I was complaining that we don't have any higher education because we lost Pell Grants in prison. Prisoners aren't eligible. So I said, I don't believe they'd come. They said, well, yes, they will. I said, okay, I'll give them a place to do it. So they said, okay, let's do it. So we start the seminary. It's pretty simple. And uh, everybody said, well, how are you going to do a seminary in prison? Well, the inmates, you know, they're going to do it. We're going to have a seminary. And so surely we did. And the inmates really got behind it because they realized they were going to get a degree like LSU. And they thought that was cool. And the, and the, the teachers came from the First Baptist Church of Baton Rouge. He was a Ph.D. professor that could work in the seminary. So we started. And we had to raise $75,000 every year, which we do, to have the seminary. The result is this. Today we have graduated about 250 inmates at full four-year preachers. And uh, we have 28 churches in Angola, and inmates are in the pulpit in those churches. Now, this is real foreign. When you go to work in prison, they say one inmate can't ever have power over another. But the preacher really doesn't have power over you because you have the freedom to go to church if you want to. You don't have to go, and it's the same in prison. We don't make you go to church. Now, we're going to show church on our TV station, thanks to the Horners, Andy Horner and Premier Design. And... Uh, and if you don't want to watch the TV on Sunday morning and you want it to be on something else and you want to sue us about it, then we'll just have the learning channel all day on Sunday and you'll miss the football game. <laughs> and so, so you see, there's another way to skin a cat and just hit him head on. My deal's gone again. That was a seminary. I just wanted to show you all this seminary. These guys are really working there. That's our class. That's what we're doing. This is the graduation. That's Dr. Kelly. And their parents and families are sitting on the side. And when a mom comes up to you and says, you know, my son had to come to prison to get an education to find God. What I really think and what I'm really saying inside is some soul had to die, you know, for someone else to find God. But I'm saying then that they didn't die in vain, maybe, because another soul was saved. And I just pray that, that, you know, the victim was a Christian. Now, what's cool about this is we have built all these churches, and we have all these inmate preachers, and folks like Henry Blackaby, and that's one of our churches. You're looking down from the front, obviously. Mike comes to see us. That's he and his wife on one of the tiers, and John MacArthur. And so... Uh, we have a lot of guests that come through. We don't like them to be in the pulpit, though, because we like to have our inmate preacher in the pulpit. This is our rodeo, and uh, this is some of our churches. And so these churches are built with private donors, and uh, they're all over the prison, so that on the 18,000 acres, you can see a, a steeple from anywhere in the prison. And you might have noticed there was a cross in the church. Now, if I'd have asked the lawyer, can I put a cross in a church? He would have surely said no. Because lawyers say no more than yes. So therefore, don't ask the lawyer. <laughs> so if you don't ask, you don't know, and ignorance is bliss. <laughs> see that cross right there in that church? So you see two crosses. But if you go and I talk to other warden, no, you can't do that. I said, who said you couldn't do it? Oh, the lawyers say you can't do it. I say, why'd you ask them? <laughs> you know? You know the answer, there's another cross on the steeple. So I want you to say, I want to tell you at the state penitentiary in Louisiana, we did the stained glass too. We built the church and we had no contractor there. We can build one of those churches in about two months. And, and uh, we just don't do the air conditioning because we want the warranty. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this is the last one. Do y'all recognize that building? That is, a, that is the Alamo. Now, uh, we know there's two Alamos. We even have the window on the right all set like you have on your Alamo. Now, the reason we built this, this is a non-denominational Catholic church. Okay? <laughs> you can't have a denomination. The ACLU will get you. <laughs> so, uh, 
Anyway, that's pretty cool charge. The reason at the Alamo is all the money came from Mexico. They hired me. To, they didn't hire me. I wouldn't take any money. But they flew me to Mexico to tell them about their prisons and all. And these, these guys had a lot of money, and they had a big old jet, and it was a Hawker 4000. I remember because it was a big one. And everywhere down there, we went to all their prisons to try to help them out. But then they wanted to do something for me. They said, what can we do for you? And I said, I don't want anything. I just want to help you do your prison. They said, well, we'll build your church. I said, that's just exactly what I want. And so, <laughs> and so they built that church cost $401,000, and all the money came from Mexico. We built that church after the slab was poured, and we have a concrete plant, so we pour the slab too. It took us 38 days to build the church. And that's from doing everything. I had 80 inmates work on it, 40 by day, 40 at night. We worked 24 hours a day. And we built the pews. We did the stained glass. We did it all. And we had to be ready by the 12th of, of uh, January for Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so anyway, it just shows I didn't build anything. I didn't do anything. This is a God thing. Because God chose the worst prison with the worst reputation in this country to see that he could change that people like that could change and really become moral people. We go weekends without fights. We have very little violence. Our violence dropped 80%. Now, it's like fish. You can't catch them all. But you can dilute them so much that your, your security is effective, is more effective. But the point is, they change. The point is, we can see revival coming from the prison because these guys are godly men. And when we do start to release some, and I feel certainly surely that we will, we're gonna start a project called the Onesimus Project where we'll send preachers to urban areas from the prison. And then they'll work in the urban area because we have a program called Malachi Dad where the inmates in prison now, they care about their children. They wanna be working and mentoring their children in the community. And that's through Malachi Dad, where it's like if you go to Iraq or you to war, you still have children, you still can mentor them, and we enable them to do that. And so that way, those children in the community, so we can send an inmate preacher to an urban area, he'll be having a toehold where he can get them involved in church. In Louisiana, we have some suburban churches who are more affluent that will pay the salary of the inmate that goes to work in the urban area. So that'll connect the urban area with the suburban area and we'll see communities start to come together. That's our dream. That's a dream that God gave us. I got the missionary. We send missionaries from our prison to other prisons in the shower. God spoke to me in the shower. I got the hospice program on Sunday morning. Now God never spoke to me until I went to this prison. Now God talks to me. Somebody will say, what you gonna do next? And I'll say, I don't know, he hasn't said yet. But he does, and he will. And it's amazing because what happens is it just comes in your mind what to do next. And so you know then that God's blessing what we do. And, and I would like to close with this with you guys. There's some things that's real important that you have to do because I have to be the father of these inmates because they didn't have one. But listen, we have some things we do. We have a sign that says, askable. You have to be askable. That's a new word. We made that up. Askable means if somebody asks you a question, if your child, your son, your daughter asks you a question, you have to answer it. In our prison, if an inmate asks somebody, a staff person, a question, you've got to stop and answer it. Knowledge is power. We know what they think when we talk to them. We want to know what they think. You don't want to fight fire, you get burned. You put out fire. In your home, you don't want to fight fire. You want to prevent fire. Fire is not good. That's when they're getting in trouble with the law. They're doing drugs. They're doing all kinds of bad things. You can prevent that, though, if you're askable. Because when they're real little, they've got to learn to follow rules at that age. When they're teenagers, it's too late. Doesn't too late. You, you almost lost them. Now, God will bring them back, but it's difficult. But when they're real little, little rules, follow the rules, and when you say something, mean it. But don't have it and don't... Just tell them all the time and boss them all the time, do this, do that, do the other. And you got to say yes more than no. You really do. If you don't say yes, you're going to cause them to sneak around on you. Say yes as much as you can. But this talking to them is really important. Now, here's the other thing. When, you, when your child says, Dad, come go do this with me, say yes. Try to say yes every time as much as you can. Come go play at Cowboys and Indians. Come go ride the four-wheeler. Come go with me in the car somewhere. Get in the car and go. Spend time with them. You had them, spend the time with them. 
You want them to have your values, not somebody else's. If you aren't talking to them, they're talking to their friends who may not have your values, who may have their dad's values, who you may not, who may not be worthy of your child's values. Your child, you know, wouldn't want the value that he has. So you really have to spend the time with them. Because if you don't, somebody like me is going to be spending the time with them possibly. And then because that's where they get rehabilitation. Go to church. My mom made me go to church. Take them to church. If you don't want to go to church, take them to church anyway. You had them, take them to church. You've got to do that. And when they're little, make them go. They don't want to go. They're going to get older. Well, you keep setting an example for them because they'll come back. It says so in the Bible. But you've got to do that because you've had them and you, wanted, you want them to turn out right, but you're the, you're, they're a product of their environment. Now, here's the other thing. In our prison, we have no profanity. Now, the inmates came to me, these inmate preachers, and said, y'all are cursing too much. And y'all shouldn't be cursing in front of the preacher. Your mama wouldn't like that. I said, you're absolutely right. She would not like that. I will never curse again, ever. Especially in front of you, but never anyway. So I meet with all the wardens, and we say, we're going to all quit cursing. There's, four, there's 19 of us, assistant warden. It's a big prison. But then everybody stops, the inmates too. So imagine going in this prison, you can take your wife or your child anywhere in the prison. There'll be no whistles, no cat call, and no profanity. Now listen, this is what this means. God changed that culture in that prison. We did not change it. I am not that smart. I promise you. <laughs> Didn't do it. Be humble, don't stumble. He changed it. He can change your home and he can change your community. Because he did Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Those inmates were praying for delivery, just a few. You know, if my people who call my name turn their face to me, I'll heal their land. He healed the land. He can heal our communities. So important. I want to say one more thing to you. Don't let your illusions become reality. When people let their illusions become reality, they make a mistake 50% of the time because you're not a mind reader. Now, this is what happens in your home. You start thinking, your wife's thinking something, or she's doing something, or she starts thinking you are, and we see divorce come, we see all these things happen in our home because we go off half-cocked with what we think. You're not a mind reader, and God don't intend for you to ever be a mind reader, so you're going to make a mistake when you run off on illusions. And so many people make that mistake. Then let's just get to one other place, because I've been there and done that. But he says you can divorce if it's been adultery. But he said you can divorce if it's been adultery because of the hardness of your heart. Read the rest of the scripture. It means because you're unforgiving. So think twice because you're hurting a child. And I don't care what you say. I don't believe what you say because I've been there and done that too. When you split your family up and your children go off and they call somebody else dad and you let this happen in your family, do all you can to stay with your wife and keep that family together because they need both of you. They need you bad. And when you, if something happens and you have to marry again, you lose your wife is gone, don't be unevenly yoked. That's the worst thing too. And marry for love and not for lust. And what happens with young people, they lust, they get married, then they have a disaster. Remember what I say because I'm picking up the pieces at Louisiana State Penitentiary of these broken homes. It's been a pleasure being with you all today. Thank you all so very much for having me. <laughs> Wonderful program. <laughs>